District of Conservation is sponsored by the Committee for a Constructive Tomorrow, better known as CFACT. To learn more about our sponsor, head over to CFACT.org. Thanks for listening to the program. Your teen requested a ride, but this time not from you. It's through their Uber teen account. You drive your teenager around a lot to their friend Jacob's house, their other friend Jake's house, to James's, to Jaden's, to Jalen's, to... Uh, Mom, this is Jake's house, not Jacob's. Now with an Uber teen account, your teen can request a ride under your supervision. They'll ride with a highly rated driver, and with live trip tracking, you'll follow along the whole ride to their friends' houses that all sound the same. Add your teen to your Uber account today. See app for details. Bye, Mom. This episode is brought to you by... Coffee Mate. Coffee Mate is the world's biggest coffee lover because we love all the ways you enjoy. What? Wait. Coffee Mate can't love coffee more than me. I'm a foodie. I went to Kyoto just for a nitro matcha latte. What? Oh, I have to finish the ad. Coffee Mate for the love of coffee. Welcome to District of Conservation. I'm your host, Gabriella Hoffman. This podcast offers a sober examination into all things hunting, fishing, shooting sports, energy, environment, and the public policy surrounding it. And this podcast also specializes in original interviews that you won't hear elsewhere. Here's what I have for you today. We're starting off with season seven on a very exciting note. You guys know we love to talk about public lands here. Right as I was going on vacation, a interesting lawsuit dropped from the state of Utah. You guys know that Utah is very... Interesting in terms of these issues, there's a lot of strong opinions about the transference of federal lands to state lands. Uh, Some may argue that what Utah proposes is a wholesale transfer of public lands to private interests. There's interest to, or there's rather ideas to entertain, you know, building affordable housing on public land. Both sides of the L have talked about this. I talked about this in a previous episode, but we're going to talk about that and even more with one of our favorite guests, Andrew Sandstrom. Here on the podcast today, he wrote a fantastic article about this lawsuit. And I'm also going to talk about some comments from a lawyer friend of mine with the National Wildlife Federation who has worked a lot in Wyoming on these issues and his concerns about this. Andrew, let's talk about this issue. Let's talk about this lawsuit. Uh, what in particular happened? Who filed this lawsuit? What are their grievances? Well, first of all, I think we should talk about me being one of your favorite guests. I'm very excited about that. Uh, but but no, I yeah, this lawsuit uh, essentially is the state asking the federal government to give back all of the Bureau of Land Management lands um, in the state of Utah. Uh, the argument is that the Constitution never intended for or allowed the federal government to retain lands indefinitely. So uh, it kind of dropped the lawsuit kind of dropped at a weird time. Um, talking with some friends who write on public lands issues about why it was timed the way it was, some people have suggested, "Oh, this is a this is a um, election year. Uh, this is a political stunt." That's not probably not true. They're not going to get any extra attention or votes from this in Utah. It's probably more to do with how long it takes the attorney Gen- attorney general's office to produce a lawsuit of this scale. It just took them a long time, and this is when they've come out with it. So they've been working on it a long time. Uh, and it the argument is essentially that using a couple of different primary sources from the time when the Constitution was written, the Founding Fathers never intended for land to be held in perpetuity. And that because of that, only Bureau of Land Management lands should be returned to the state. The state says they don't want national parks back. They don't want national forests back. They don't want lands owned by uh, by Federal Wildlife uh, Federation. Um, or they don't want any of the lands that people think of as parks back. They just want the un- what they call unappropriated lands from the BLM. And that would be 18.5 million BLM acres, correct? Yes, yeah, a huge amount of land. Utah is uh, mostly or nearly mostly managed by the BLM. Would you say that this was precipitated going off the housing issue? Because I've heard that if they were to prevail at the Supreme Court, it's I'm not a lawyer and neither are you. But from my understanding, what I had heard from hearing about this lawsuit myself too, and what the intention is, petitioning directly to the Supreme Court is a very ballsy move uh, for one thing. Um, As we know, Andrew, you and I have discussed this. I've talked about this on the podcast at length. 
This kind of grows, goes back to the Greater Antiquities Act discussion, which Supreme Court Justice John Roberts has said at some point, our court, especially Congress even too, separate from the Supreme Court, will have to revisit this issue because it's so unclear what presidential powers are under Section 2, or it's been misused. So they have said, the Supreme Court has said, we would like to see, or we could be open to challenging what the Antiquities Act is or clarifying presidential powers. That's a more appropriate thing for me to say. What does that look like? Is it wide sweeping? Is it very limited? Uh, Because the language is so broad that it could be interpreted one way or another, and it's an over a hundred year law. Um, I wonder if it does stem back to that. So where are you thinking, Andrew, that your fellow Utahans are going? Is it a housing thing? They're trying to mitigate housing crisis, uh, building up on public lands, which like I expressed on a previous episode before we launched season seven, I have a lot of concerns with that, whether it's a Democrat or Republican proposal, or is this going back to the Greater Antiquities Act situation? So first of all, on housing, I, ha- I share your your hesitancies and concerns about using public lands for housing. I think that a lot of people in Utah would like to see public land used for housing just because there's so much of it. But I don't think that's what this is about. I think there's a risk here, which is if the state gets the land, there's not as much holding them back from liquidating portions of it. Now, they've re- they've said many times that's not their intention. Uh, they've even created, back in 2017, they passed a bill creating a uh, Utah department that would essentially replace the Bureau of Land Management. So they already know how they would manage the lands. Um, and they even suggest that they would poach BLM land managers to come work for that uh, department, right? So they're saying they want to sort of maintain the status quo on multiple use. Uh, in terms of the Antiquities Act, this is you know, no, nothing to do with the Antiquities Act and everything to do with the Antiquities Act. The tension that is built up to produce this lawsuit has everything to do with uh, Escalante Grand Staircase National Monument and Bears Ears National Monuments. Uh, but also the lawsuit, as I understand it, again, I'm not a lawyer, it's saying it only wants unappropriated lands back. That means that the lands appropriated in national monuments, to my understanding, would not be returned to the state. So it it wouldn't fix the problem we have with the Antiquities Act. We would still have to address either in the courts or in Congress, and I think we'll end up needing to do it in Congress. Uh, we'll have to address the Antiquities Act separately. Let's insert some legal opinion here. I'm citing a post from a friend of mine, David Wilms, who is Associate Vice President of Public Lands at the National Wildlife Federation. He's a pretty conservative guy. I like to look to him as an authority on this type of stuff, even if we're disagreeing on certain areas or kind of certain caveats where we may have some differences or slightly different strategies, but I largely agree with where he's thinking. He has some interesting questions. He says, reading Utah's motion for leave to file bill of complaint and its accompanying brief in support left me with many questions. He's wrestling with including, there are four questions, would an order declaring perpetual ownership of quote, unappropriated federal lands in Utah be unconstitutional, be limited to lands only in Utah or apply to unappropriated federal lands unconstitutionally held nation? Why? That's a good question. Uh, What are unappropriated federal lands and is Utah's loose definition of them correct? That's an interesting question too. Three, would a decision declaring perpetual ownership of federal lands as unconstitutional only apply to lands managed by BLM as Utah suggests, or could he, or could it rather apply to forest service, national park, fish and wildlife service and Bureau of reclamation? That's another good point. And four, if Utah prevails, should we expect the federal government to transfer ownership of these lands to the state of Utah, sell them to the highest bidder or some combination of the two? What about land in other states? I think those are great questions. And he's a lawyer. So I want to see and hear from other lawyers too. And I know the lawyers in Utah articulated a case that unappropriated lands would be really limited in Utah. But he does offer some interesting questions, David, about does this extend? Is it far reaching even beyond Utah? The scope of what they're targeting with BLM. Uh, We don't know how the Supreme Court will view it. Maybe they will say it's limited or maybe they'll say it's beyond the scope if they take up the case. Uh, But what do you think about his kind of posing of questions here about the definition, if it will be exclusive to Utah or not? Well, as you pointed out, I'm not a lawyer, but I think his questions are spot on. And I think that question, and and I misspoke earlier when I was talking about lands that were excluded, I meant the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Yeah, I know what you were talking about. Yeah. Uh Well, you know, his question about would the, the land managed by those other agencies be included, right? The state says, no, we don't want those lands back. But then the way they define unappropriated lands uh, you know, they're they're using an originalist constitution, you know, originalist argument about the intent of the constitution uh, 
And uh, I'm not a legal scholar. I can't really draw the lines between originalism and textualism, but they looked, they looked to some examples of what was the intent, and they looked to some examples of what does the text of the Constitution say. And in both of those arguments, the argument they're setting up makes it seem like the, na- like the founding fathers never intended for there to be national parks, right? And they're probably right. You know, George Washington did not envision national parks. If somebody has some evidence otherwise, please send it to me. But we, um, I'm a big fan of, you know, sticking to the Constitution and the vision of our founding fathers. But this isn't a program that was on their minds when they established the Constitution. And so if you're, if you're going all the way back to the 1780s and saying, hey, the Constitution was never supposed to allow for federal ownership of lands, I don't know how you escape the fact that the Forest Service, the Park Service, the Fish and Wildlife Service, and the Bureau of Reclamation are all ways that the federal government is permanently owning land. And they're saying the federal government was not supposed to permanently own land. That's a question we'll probably hear argued, right? Although I think most people, and it it doesn't make you, I I would say, against the Constitution to like national parks because I think there's a purpose. Maybe certain things change. I don't know if you need to codify it into the Constitution eventually that, you know, there is a right or there has to be some management of public lands or you have to explicitly state this. But I think they also left it to interpretation for future generations to wrestle with for themselves uh, if there is a rightful place for this. But I think as our country evolved, we did see a need for it. And Congress created different laws. Um, Some may say it strays away from the Constitution. Others say no, it perfectly aligns. And maybe our founders left it up to us to decide, you know, what laws to have or what laws not to have. And you write in your article about, um, you know, multiple use management of public lands. We've talked about this at great lengths. Um, The objective isn't to lock up the land, but to conserve its resources forever. So great, great grandchildren can hunt the same forest and run cattle in the same pastures. And I'm reading from your Utah News Dispatch article. You talk about an interesting thought here, both preservationism, which we've both uh, kind of skewered at length. And then you say even multiple use management have their downsides, but preservationism is the more nuclear option, you argue. It excludes traditional land uses such as agriculture and hinders conservation through practices like forestry, hunting, habitat restoration, prevents energy projects, including clean energy left unchecked. It threatens our energy security, our rural farmers, and our ability to prevent catastrophic wildfires, et cetera, et cetera. And you argue, like we've talked about at length, that Democrat presidents have allowed preservationist groups to grow their influence through administrative rules, monument designations, our favorite public lands rule. Uh, Andrew, you mentioned at length here and and how they have just contorted and twisted, you know, in, I think even illegally, too, because there was a CRA done to undo BLM 2.0. So Biden and company were not technically, my understanding, legally allowed to create a similar rule that mirrored the previous rule that was invalidated by Congress and then, you know, fully invalidated by Trump in 2017. And so you kind of tie that into your article about this potential lawsuit. So what else from this article in terms of the, if the Supreme Court refuses to hear the lawsuits or favors that you still say, and you argue that BLM will control a good chunk of Utah's land and that environmentalists will push harder to restrict recreation, grazing, and mineral development. So what else do you want to talk about from the article, too, and just your thoughts from this lawsuit? Well, just that, which is we're prepared to win the lawsuit. Uh, I think that, per usual, the state's foresight and preparations are remarkable. Um, It's not every state that would, you know, preemptively set up a department and have plans for hiring just in case they win. That's remarkable. And that, that, to me, is a good sign about if they win although I think it's more likely that they lose. But it's just that, is if they lose, what's our plan? How are we getting... Uh, because I think the concern doesn't come from... I mean, there's there's frustration over ownership of the land, but I think that the broader frustration is over threats to multiple use and over outside interest groups and ideology controlling what happens to the land rather than the needs of the communities nearby. And traditionally, the federal government use... And, and we should mention... Ownership of land was one of the reasons that the Constitutional Convention happened. Dealing with public lands, dealing with lands not owned by the states or lands westward of the colonies was an issue that the Articles of Confederation did not cover. And the Bill of Complaint for the lawsuit actually cites some of the history there that having some kind of system for disposing of federal lands was part of the impetus for the Constitution. And traditionally, right, when Utah became a state and gave up ownership, Uh, of these lands through those negotiations, they expected the federal government and what was then the General Lands Office 
to be a supportive entity for the communities, a supportive entity for energy development, for agriculture. Uh, a lot of that's changed. There's been good changes with conservation, but lately with preservationism, we've seen some changes that really threaten the the lifestyles and interests of the communities that are actually close to this land, right? That's what state leaders are really concerned about. And so in my article, I make the case that we should be keeping our eye on how to push some reforms through Congress that protect Utah and other Western states from this sort of ideological management of lands. And I think the way you do this, you do that, and you mentioned this earlier with the Antiquities Act, is you limit the power of the president and you shift a lot of power back to Congress because when things happen through Congress, they happen more permanently, more negotiations are made, more deals are made, and policy lasts longer. And when you do it through the president, uh, you get a really extractive focus when a Republican's in power and a really restrict, you know, restrictive policy when a Democrat's in power. And you ping pong back and forth between that and everybody loses. That's a good summary, too. And I would say if it fully goes back into Congress's court, there are different variations of what Antiquities Act reform would look like in addition to presidential authority and, and limiting the scope of that or clarifying the powers more. I think several proposals have said you have to get the consent of the state that this would affect. And there are currently exemptions, I believe, for Alaska and Wyoming, where they're not impacted by Antiquities Act designations. They can't be because of just certain provisions. But Biden has still uh, closed off a lot of areas in Alaska in particular, 56 actions executive wise have been taken against Alaska, even ignoring this particular exemption in the Antiquities Act for them. And also in Wyoming, too, they have a lot of these conservation areas, millions of acres that could be uh, similarly subjective to, you know, natural asset company holdings or uh, antic uh, national monuments, I think, is another particular thing where there's kind of these hybrid areas of public private lands and creating more national monuments from that as well through, I forget the exact conservation areas. They just finalized the plan in Wyoming, right? Oh, Rocky Springs. I think that or Rock Springs uh, National Conservation Area, whatever it's called. Um, they're looking to do something like that. They're combining, you know, Antiquities Act, national monuments, what have you. And so, um, yeah, it, it will be back in Congress's court. That's what I feel. And if the Supreme Court does hear this in some surprising fashion, that would be an interesting case to watch. But I think it's kind of opaque for them. I think they want something like a for there are several forestry cases that were heard before the Supreme Court, but they never took them up or they were preliminarily heard. And so they heard it and said, well, not at this time. And so I think there could be other cases where you challenge it. And I agree, I think challenging it on the Antiquities Act way instead of just going directly to them, you know, even from the outside of an as a non-lawyer. I think that's a smarter, tactful way, because I think, like you, as you argue, preservationism is antithetical. And I think selling off every parcel of federal land is another extreme view. It's not as widely held as like preservationism is. It's a minority opinion, I think, even on the right, even though our friends on the left say, no, no, all Republicans want to depose of public lands, which you and I disagree with. I think a fundamental Majority of people do not support that because people see the value of multiple use lands and also going to national parks. And, and we don't want to become like the rest of the world. I've, I've been to places in Europe where there's far less public land. It's really hard to access land. We don't want to become like that because then we turn into something not American um, with respect to that. And only, you know, the wealthy and the affluent and the connected can own and access public lands, which would be detrimental to what kind of ethos we have here in the States where anyone can access. You don't need to be a landowner. And, and this is not, you know, a stab at private land ownership. Private land ownership is wonderful. This is a separate thing uh, from that notion. But this is making it so, like, it's accessible wherever it is open and public to the public. Uh, it remains that way and doesn't become like England or a very restrictive country like that where privilege and connection is the way that you access land. That would be very antithetical to the U.S. We don't want that. So I think we're going to be wrestling with this question of do we go in the full preservationist or full extractive direction, I think a healthy medium is what is needed here, right? And we need a forum in which negotiating between those and other parties is possible. And when you're doing everything through presidential edict, it doesn't work that way. And I so, agree. and you know, you mentioned Europe and Europe hunting's a rich man's sport, right? You and I can go out and hunt. And I don't know about you, Gabriella, but I, I, I suppose you're about as wealthy as I am, which is we're not rich people, right? We're not, we would not be hunters in in England or in Germany, you know, my parents travel to Germany a lot and they talked to a guy who was a hunter and, you know, he was an executive of a, a pretty, he had a pretty cushy job and that's what you have to do to be able to hunt there. Everything's private yep. land. And it's so, connections. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, we, 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 you know, I went and shot a couple of birds last year. My first experience hunting, it cost me 30 bucks. I got a class, I got a guided tour. You know, that's the kind of, we love having those programs. Um, and, and I should mention the state of Utah doesn't want to liquidate all this land. That's not going to happen. Right. Did some of it get liquidated though. I think they, they, their intent is not necessarily to do that. Are they opening up the ins- the possibility of that being possible? Well, well, yeah, they are because it's easy to do that when it's managed at the state level. You know, I would be maybe a little bit less. I, I would be a little bit less cautious about states owning land if there was some kind of provision that guaranteed that wasn't going to happen. But it's just easier to change things at a state level, and that can be really beneficial. It, it can lead to a lot better management of resources, but it can also mean that things get liquidated better. And that's one of the benefits of federal ownership. And again, I've been, I'm on the same team with with the folks who are putting out this this lawsuit. I want to see state-led management. But I think there's a way forward without throwing the baby out with the bathwater, if that makes sense. Yeah, and we know the plaintiffs, a lot of the people behind this, we may have some disagreements about the transference of public land, but I think you know, if you talk to them, you understand that they're not wanting to sell every single thing or that's how their plans are interpreted. But uh, we will have to see what the Supreme Court says, essentially, you know, on this question. And I think also Utah's grievances are correct because we've just seen anytime there have been Democrat presidents, just this complete abject lack of consideration. There's no stakeholder relationships or stakeholder input. It's everything predetermined. And of course, people are going to propose kind of the radical plan on the other side to say, hey, you didn't listen to us. We're going to play games with you and show, you know, we're serious about opposing you and propose this, you know, kind of extreme or way out there proposal to get you to listen to us. Maybe this is a marketing ploy or a marketing tool uh, for them to finally have their voice heard. You know, I think they wanted the lawsuit to gain a lot of attention, even if it does kind of sound a little, you know, out there. Um, I think it was partly a good marketing plan because everyone was talking about it, the AP, all these different outlets. And so, um, perhaps that was just a way to negotiate and and get people to to say that we have some serious grievances. We may not succeed, but we got you to listen to our complaints. I mean, that's possible. I think they're dead serious, though. I but think, you think they're dead serious. Oh yeah. Okay. I, I mean, I think the you know I don't think it's a. I guess what I'm saying is it's definitely not a bluff. I think they definitely want this to win. They think they have a shot. I know you and I have both had conversations with folks who have, you know, been involved with the white paper several years ago up until this, uh, till this lawsuit. And they, you know, they're dead serious about wanting state ownership of lands. And I also would say, again, their intentions are pretty pure in, in terms of what they want to do with it. My concern is what about the people 10 years from now who take their place? And that's why institutional protections on the land remaining public are important, not just their intentions, but actually knowing that 10, 20, 40 years from now, you know, my son and daughter and their kids are going to be able to enjoy the same resources as public resources. Right. That's my that's my only concern. I I think they're dead, dead serious about getting them to be state lands. I don't want it to be sold to the highest bidder to build more public housing, because exactly. I think everyone has seen what public housing in urban centers does urban settings does it's it's a mess anyone will tell you who works in that policy niche it's it's a nightmare it's not working something is amiss with that policy and you bring that to public lands rural areas where there's already an, enough sets of challenges already underway and then you add this into the mix like and then you know the joke is you don't nobody wants to see billboards and and people move to the west to escape the the conundrum and you know the travails of rural or uh excuse me, urban living. So why do they want that brought to their backyard closer to that? Like the, the intention is to keep things remote, kind of inaccessible for that very reason. You're not going to try to m- recreate areas near national parks to be like urban centers, which is where I disagree with Trump and his proposals for these freedom cities that he wants to do. Like there's no way that's ever going to happen. Just the geography, you know this, having grown up in Utah and I've traveled there myself too, even being from California, it's really impossible to build in those regions. They don't even have hospitals in some areas. So could you imagine a freedom city? It'll never materialize. There's no infrastructure there for that. And why would we build from scratch when we have existing Mm -hmm. cities there? When we have it, and and why are those cities not becoming 
metropolises the way that Trump seemed to envision, right? There's reasons for that, like you mentioned, services. But also that's not where the demand is, right? The demand for housing isn't in Blanding and Monticello, Utah. Now there's demand for housing in Moab because of the recreation industry there, but the folks there don't want any more housing, right? <laughs> like it's just the places where we need land and it needs to be privately developed is on the Wasatch Front in Utah, right? I'm in Colorado right now. The places we need developed are by the Front Range. These are not areas where you have abundant air bureau of land management now there's some by provo that's across the lake but these are areas where uh they're not they're not where the demand is the demand is in these urban areas where you don't have a lot of blm plans so i think there's also the problem of it doesn't solve doesn't solve the problem right and i think there's been we're kind of feeding into the the left's i would say broad brush painting of republicans if the the goal, like you said, without those assurances, let's say in 10 years, if it's just, just like dispose of all public lands, that's a very big problem. I would not agree with such a plan or a proposal. As a conservationist and as a conservative, I think there's a place for public lands. They have to be managed properly and you have to allow for recreational uses too. Um, you and I have talked at length about the different recreational uses that are starting to be eroded at, chipped at away. And some people don't see any value in that. And that's really unfortunate. But there, there is a use and a utility to public lands. I think every user has a right to to access it, whether for commercial, if it's their livelihood, or for recreational. And we want to keep a semblance of that, I think, going forward uh, compared to, let's say, you know, we all have complaints. And, and I've talked at length about my problems with natural asset companies. I'm also concerned about the right version of that, like this, if you open it up to developers to do housing uh, in this respect. So people who were opposing NACs, rightfully so, I was part of those efforts and I will be part of those efforts again if they arise. Um, it's really funny that they're not concerned about potential developers who may be tied to China or other places, uh, okay. foreign adversaries, potentially, let's say they depose of the lands, um, the 18.5 mil, uh, million acres in Utah. What if those are sold to adversaries to develop house. Like people don't know where we're, we're inviting, I think, in, in my opinion, um, if it's not carefully done or if it's broadly of a bro uh, broadly of a paintbrush uh, kind of stroke here. So I think there are, there are complaints about, or I think there are concerns that need to be wrestled with and heard. Obviously I more so like that of my friend, like David Wilms, who has serious questions. I think the dismissiveness from some of the people on the left, it's the typical dismissiveness just because that's how they are. But I think questions being posed by us, uh, by my friend David and a couple others, um, are worth listening and, and considering. And, and like I said, this is not us knocking people in Utah. I think it's a very fascinating case, not necessarily agree with all of its tenants. And I don't know if it's going to advance uh, before the Supreme Court, but I'm curious to follow it to see if it will lead to something like Antiquities Act or if it's going to open up kind of a can of worms, you know, fascinating either way, I think. Yeah, it'll be interesting. It'll it will be definitely be interesting to see where it goes. Andrew, if every sorry, I'm going to be editing a lot of this <laughs> jet lag, still kicking it. Andrew, okay. Andrew, if anyone wants to read your article, connect with you on this issue, where would you like to send them to? We're also going to include links to the lawsuit too, so people can read it for themselves. Worth reading, even if you disagree. Where would you like to send people to for the article and you're connecting with you and your thoughts on this? Well. Uh, I am coming out with a podcast uh, that's going to be happening in the next few weeks. And I wish that we had developed, uh, I wish we'd released already on Apple podcasts and Spotify, but we haven't. So I'm going to ask people to follow me at a Sandstrom 451, a Sandstrom 451 on Twitter. And I'll be posting there when the podcast launches. I'll also be posting articles as I come out with them. I'm going to be doing a lot more writing in the next several months about issues like this uh, through outlets, you know, both in Utah and hopefully nationally. So they can also find those by following me there. We'll always link to you. Uh, show notes always have your private information or your, your account information. I wish you success with that too, Andrew. And I always like talking to you on these matters. I feel like you're a very sober, even-ended person to talk about this because we do have our grievances with the federal government, but do we want a total upending of public Maybe not so much. So I always like having you on because you present a fair account. You're fair to all parties involved. And I will encourage everyone to to read your piece here uh, to learn more about this lawsuit. And maybe by the time we release this, the Supreme Court will have said, okay, maybe yes, 
maybe not. Um, or maybe it's kind of like forward thinking into a potential case, but thank you for coming on Andrew and we will have you back on if the Supreme court, you know, regardless of direction, maybe we will have you on to talk about this again. Thanks for having me on. Always good to talk to you. If you enjoyed this installment of district of conservation, I would love to know your feedback. Send it my way. Please be sure to leave us reviews on Apple, Spotify, or wherever podcasts are played. And also check us out on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter to never miss a beat nor a guest announcement. Thanks so much for listening to District of Conservation. I hope you have a wonderful day and please share the podcast to those who may be interested in learning more about these critical natural resources, environment, energy issues.